everybody for joining Cab 2 Chat and Chew. We used to chat together, uh, chew together, but now we're going to chat. So feel free to eat lunch. Uh, that's why it's scheduled in this uh, time space. because We did used to eat lunch. And one of these days, we will be able to eat lunch together. I look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, to the two on the cab two is to remind you that um, we would like to grow our network of folks who are able to get this information from us. So please to the next cab two, please invite two people. And we hope that those two people will in turn invite two additional people so that we can grow exponentially. Um, so I wanna um, now introduce our speaker for today and uh, um, and thank them for being here with us. And also thank you to Amy for really elevating um, uh, this opportunity to our attention. Amy from Women's Cancer Resource Center, a member of our CAB. So I wanna introduce our speaker for today. Um, and our speaker is Cassandra Falby. Uh, Cassandra, can you wave so that people can find you um, on their Zoom screens? Uh, Cassandra is formerly with the Women's Cancer Resource Center as a program director, but um, uh, they are also a licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice here in Oakland. Cassandra works with a range of clients, including those living with cancer and other chronic diseases. Their clinical interests in attachment theory, intergenerational trauma, and values-based therapeutic interventions. Cassandra believes that mental health support should be widely and easily accessible. I think we're all feeling that right now in COVID um, and that it, it addresses the various needs of diverse communities. The commitment to social justice and equity movement spans almost 30 years for, for Cassandra, starting as a grassroots organizer in the Midwest. At this point, Cassandra continues to advocate for historically marginalized communities, both BIPOC, LGBTQ, and disabled communities, um, and, and dedicates time to creating welcoming spaces where people can thrive. So I'm so excited to have her, uh, to have them here to talk about um, how COVID has impacted the mental health of BIPOC communities um, and, and maybe begin the dialogue about what we can as individuals and as a collective do about that. So I'd like to turn it over now to Cassandra. Thank you for being here. Certainly, thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, hi everyone, I'm really, really excited to be here and to just in kind of hopefully engage during the Q&A just in, in conversation and dialogue around mental health. I really feel that the more that we can talk about this and definitely within communities of color, the more that we can talk about mental health, we're really, we're really on the right track to supporting our communities um, and changing the ways that we think about what mental health means and even how, how mental health services um, and wellness services are, are provided. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. This is always the exciting part. Here we go. Yeah, the technology and does the screen share work? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see. While they're putting that up, please put your questions in the chat as we go along. We'll be tracking them and trying to make sure that everybody gets uh, a response. If you don't get responded to in this um, session, then uh, we'll follow up with you and try to get those. Uh, and with Cassandra, try to get those. All right. Let's see, let me try, let me try going back again. Let's see. I had it all prepped and this is, this is what happens. It's, it's Mercury in retrograde, I agree. I'm on that now. <laughs> okay. I just have to re -cue it up here. Okay, I think we're, we're in business. While the business is opening, uh, folks would mind just put your name and uh, in the chat and your organization so we can get a sense of who's here. It's a big group this time. Really excited to see you. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I decided to uh, name this uh, presentation or this talk, really it's a conversation as I mentioned, 
whole body health. And um, one of the reasons I did that is really looking at how um, whole body health, we talk about that being related to physical, emotional, and spiritual health and wellness. Um, I also feel that whole body health isn't just about um, one's, one individual's uh, physical, emotional, and spiritual wellness, but that it's also about our community's health. And we really need to look at how our communities function, what our community's needs are, um, and then even kind of uh, refining that right. even more. Who are the folks who, right um, who are the folks who comprise our communities? And we really also want to look at the collective needs um, and the collective health of individuals. So I see these all kind of as being bundled. But one of the reasons why I think it's important to focus on uh, community health is that is historically how folks of color function. That is how we thrive. That is how we come together. That is how we heal. That is how we learn. And um, I just uh, wanted to kind of provide this quote as a place to jump off um, uh, from Bell Hooks, that when we talk about uh, that which will sustain and nurture our spiritual growth as a people, we must once again talk about the importance of community. And for one of the most vital ways we sustain our, ourselves is by building communities of resistance, uh, places where we know we are not alone. And I think that that is really um, critical and crucial to how we are, uh, how we conceptualize healing and how we conceptualize support. That, um, and if we even think about this in terms of um, um, kind of individualistic cultures and how you take care of yourself, you focus on yourself, what do you as an individual need? And while that is true, what we've learned uh, with the pandemic is that we are all being impacted. We all are experiencing all of this, um, this uh, kind of, it's community trauma is what we're experiencing and it's ongoing. And we are also in a place where we are experiencing um, this kind of extended bereavement. So for some of us, imagine that we are um, in a place where we are already having uh, different, experiencing different emotional states. We are have experiencing low mood, we're experiencing anxiety, depression, anger, um, and then we layer on top of that a pandemic, the struggle, as they say, is real. So um, I want to kind, of, um, kind of frame it this way, that in the past two years, all of us have been enrolled in a crash course on what to do and what not to do in a pandemic. So I have not been through a pandemic before. I believe that none of us here have. So it's, this is all a really um, new um, adventure and path that has been challenging to say the least. And we've all been learning, you know, how to, we've learned a lot about the physical symptoms, right? We've learned a lot about um, what to do in terms of taking care of our health. Um, we've learned about masking, um, getting vaccinated, getting booster, um, getting boosted. Um, as well as uh, physical distancing. So we, we, there's been a lot around physical health and conversation around what to do to take care of ourselves. And now we've also experienced, uh, there are other variants we've experienced too, Delta and Omicron, right? And we're learning that um, more recently that Omicron is um, more uh, transmissible um, than perhaps that's the idea that it's more transmissible. So um, we also can't forget that Delta is still present. So Delta didn't pack up its things and, you know, and, and move to some other, um, some other planet. It's still here with us. And uh, one of the things we do know is that folks who have been vaccinated, folks who've received their booster shots um, have, better, have better health outcomes. So this virus has descended upon us and um, it's compromised our physical health, which in turn has compromised our, um, and severely impacted our emotional health and our emotional wellness. And it also has challenged our, our psychic, our spiritual wellness. It's really um, um, caused us to have to really do deep dive and look at how we've been, um, how we're living, how we build community, 
the relationships we've had, how we spend our time, um, so on and so forth. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, how um, BIPOC communities, as I mentioned, really rely on our uh, networks for emotional and uh, support and social connection. And as you can see here, I provided some of examples um, how we spend time. We spend time with family. We spend time with friends. We spend time with individuals and folks in our faith-based communities. We maybe visit a neighbor down the street. We spend time with other folks in the neighborhood. Uh, we're used to maybe, maybe we're not going to the barbershop to get our hair cut, but we pass through to say hello and engage in conversation. Uh, we might have folks over to, to watch sports, play dominoes, play spades. Um, or even have times when we gather and go out to do things in the community, dinner, to go see a concert, um, or, even, or even a movie. So those are some of the things that um, we engage in. We, we really are about being part of a collective. But the challenge with COVID, right, is that it has uh, really disrupted this really, you know, really important way that folks of color come together, how folks of color um, um, really have support and find community. And it's how we take care of ourselves. It's how we take care of each other. And even merely just the act of coming together as folks of color, um, that really is, a, is really about, um, you know, I feel is really an act of resistance, how we decide to celebrate, how we decide to take up space, how we decide to share space with one another. So let's think about now with the presence of COVID, we can't do things the way that we used to. So, so what has that, at, at, that impact been emotionally? So the impact, and, and these are some things that um, you all may have uh, discussed in your own um, personal or professional circles or networks, that the impact, one of the, the, the things that have been, has been incredibly hard has been increased isolation. Um, increased isolation uh, gives rise to um, greater anxiety, greater low mood or depression, or just being angry about the situation, being angry about the fact that we can't gather, the fact that we can't, um, the fact that we can't come together and heal the way that we did pre um, pre pandemic. Um, it also, as I mentioned before, it's, it disrupts the opportunities to gather. So kind of that list that I, pro that I provided before are different ways that we come together you know, to celebrate, um, to laugh, to love on each other, to, um, to grieve, just how we um, support one another. The impact is also daily routines. Now, one of the benefits of having a routine is that your, your, your brain kind of can just do what it needs to do. And so it's just able to kind of, you know, kind of repurpose energy and focus on um, other more uh, challenging ways of being. So making other types of decisions. But when you have your routine, you, you know, perhaps you get up, you brush your teeth, you, you kind of have different steps or things that you do. And with the presence of COVID, that has been disrupted. So you're so you are having to, you're not quite sure what the next step is. You're not quite sure what your options are. You're not quite sure what you have to choose from. Um, just things are um, in a state of flux. So that uncertainty can be a stressor and can, can move you into places of worry, anxiety, depression, as I mentioned before. Earlier in the, um, in the pandemic, there was also the issue around when we were um, all supposed to be um, um, kind of um, at home and just kind of making sure that we were not um, spending time with folks and that we were sheltering in place and so forth. There was just, if, if you had, were aware of grocery stores, resources were incredibly scarce. It was difficult to have access to food. So what for folks who um, are impacted when they actually rely on, um, on nonprofits to provide food, to provide um, to access to, to sustenance. And that was, that's something too that is a concern and was a concern and still continues to be a concern um, as people um, have um, 
um, lost their jobs or they um, have decreased income, there are worries and concerns about their family's health. How are they going to survive? How are they going to do? Do what they need to do to make it through their days. In addition, there, for some, there has been the stress of the lack of choice to work. So some folks have had uh, the privilege um, of being able to work from home where they are able to have that option. Sometimes it's work from home, they might be able to go into the office, but there is some, um, some decision making. There's, there's power in being able to make that decision. Uh, for other folks, um, if they're essential workers, uh, frontline jobs in which uh, Black and Latinx folks are overrepresented, there isn't that option. The option really is not an option, which is you either quit your job to stay safe or you go to work. And there is, there is anxiety around exposing family members to COVID and having to make these difficult choices. Um, and really wanting to stay safe, but not necessarily having um, that, that option, that option. In addition, there are multi-generational households um, where there are grandparents, great-grandparents, children, and when everyone is living um, under the same um, roof, it's different to have that, um, that be, um, to be able to, to uh, do the social distancing that was prescribed by public health officials and so forth. So I also see and feel that there is an impact that is definitely psychological around the anti-Asian violence. Same, same questions that, mm -hmm. that, asked. that, that occurred. Um, that is um, the anti-Asian violence that occurred that um, where bigotry was normalized and sanctioned by um, those in power, um, political power at that time during 2020 and 2021. And that really set in motion um, uh, various members of the Asian communities feeling unsafe. And, and it actually um, uh, emboldened folks to harass, to assault uh, some Asian folks. And, 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 and there was that, that was communicated to me by, um, by different um, community members and so forth where they felt unsafe. They weren't sure um, where they were welcome to be. And when that type of message is set in motion by, um, by the powers that be, then that really, uh, really kind of makes it such that people feel free to, um, to engage in, um, in violent and assaultive behavior. In addition, during the, um, during the earlier part of the pandemic in 2020, um, there were what I experienced and uh, talked through with some of the clients that I work with, uh, some of my um, black clients, were just feelings of, again, feelings of, um, of just uncertainty and, and feelings, just not feeling safe uh, with the longstanding um, public health issue of how Black communities and Black people are policed. So the, the, the kind of, when I'm thinking about some of the things that my clients uh, were feeling, one of the questions that came up was um, um, really around the anxiety and the worry of, well, we're in a pandemic, there is all of this going on. And even in a pandemic, Black people cannot be safe. Black people can, do not matter and Black people um, cannot be, um, be cared for. And that was incredibly distressing to clients. And in, in, in sessions we, um, with different clients I have, we talked about um, um, what their feelings were and just used that space for them to process and share um, what was happening for them, even, you know, providing space for them to talk about uh, stories um, of people in their families or loved ones who have experienced anti-Black violence. So that was, um, that was really um, 
as they would share with me later, helpful to be able to unpack some of those, some of those um, challenging feelings and experiences. And when we kind of move into the domain of health, um, some of my clients who are either living with cancer or are living with other chron chronic illnesses um, questioned whether they should attend medical appointments, um, whether they should go for their treatment, whether they should delay their treatment, whether they should reschedule. And, um, and these were, you know, I, I mean, I always withhold these as, as real concerns because we are talking about, and at that time we knew far less than we do now about COVID. Um, but really providing a space for them to share what their concerns were and to reflect back um, um, what they were sharing and that feelings are, are their feelings were, were valid feelings. And for, um, for some of those clients as well, if they're in treatment um, at that time, uh, for some of my clients who, um, uh, were, um, in, you know, um, going to chemo uh, treatment, they had moments too where they were um, nervous and they were um, experiencing the somatic effects of having worry, having concerns. So they were already having um, issues with treatment impacting their, their digestion, their digestive system. And then now we're talking about um, their worries and concerns about staying safe because they're immunocompromised. So, you know, it, some of that was about, um, you know, some of the ways that we handled that um, were suggesting and just kind of talking about the likelihood of them um, speaking to nutritionists to, you know, stay in um, communication with their, with their care team, um, just so that way they are not isolating themselves. Because that, again, as I mentioned um, previously, isolation, um, and COVID really kind of go hand in hand. And that, that happened, that just because of the structure of um, how we have to, how we have to be able to um, um, kind of distance and socially distance, we uh, really talked about those types of things about how they can still, you know, maybe they um, make decisions to socially distance, but to do their best to stay in touch with their their care providers. And finally, related to um, chronic illness management, the uncertainty of what does having, what does living with illness mean? For them, what does it mean to live with cancer? What is the impact of treatment? And how long are they going to have to be in treatment? The uncertainty of what will happen with their, regarding their diagnosis. And then the other question of, well, how long will COVID be around? How long will I have to live like this? So there was this kind of layered or double uncertainty regarding how they um, might move forward. So just briefly here, we'll talk a little bit about um, just mentioning some barriers to mental health care. Um, and I would like for us to kind of in the Q&A maybe have more of a discussion around this. So when we're looking at barriers to health care, um, one element is access. We always talk about access, access to care in general. Well, with mental health care, um, mental health care systems as well have been overwhelmed for requests for services. So um, we're talking about um, cost of, of accessing mental health care, whether folks are insured or not, whether their insurance covers, um, wh whether insurance covers mental health care services, whether it's group mental health care, or maybe what they desire is really one-on-one -on -one care. And then we have to talk about um, um, kind of frequency of, of, of their um, appointments. So maybe they, maybe they recovered for six sessions and what they really need is something um, longer term or even to have 12 or 15 sessions just to be able to build that therapeutic rapport with, um, with their therapist. Stigma is also something that is present in BIPOC communities. And um, there's a way that um, mental health services and mental health care um, continues to be seen as something that is more for white people. And the, what we're really kind of wanting to encourage 
and to change are the perceptions of what therapy is and what therapy can be. Um, and the idea for certain folks is that, especially for folks who are new to therapy, is that you kind of come in and that perhaps you're kind of interrogated or asked a lot of questions rather than it being something where the, the client gets to decide what the objectives and the goals for therapy are, how they want to engage in therapy, what their comfort level is. And to, to really highlight that therapy is, is, is there's an exchange there, there's a relationship piece, there's a relational piece. Um, and then also thinking about who goes to therapy, that really saying that therapy is for everyone and anyone who seeks it. Anyone who seeks to uh, improve the quality of their life, seeks to experience greater ease, um, those are, um, therapy is right for them. Therapy is for anyone. And um, the stigma is that therapy is for people who have um, severe persistent mental health issues, or it's for those people over there, or it's not for people like me, but that therapy is available to, um, to anyone and it's for everyone. And also to think about what the benefits of therapy are and to, to share that therapy is a place where you can um, go to improve areas of your life. Um, you can decide that um, there are ways that you want to live um, more, a more fulfilling life. How do you do that? Therapy can help with unpacking certain um, kind of longstanding challenging issues, um, unhelpful patterns of engagement, um, and those types of things. Another barrier to mental health care, um, honestly, is trust with systems, is trust with systems of care. And that is why the relationship, the relationship, the relationship, I can't stress it enough, is so important in how we engage with clients. And definitely that's, um, regardless of the modality that I use with clients, and I use different ones when I'm working with um, individuals, couples, families, I really am focusing on the relationship because there has to be trust and there has to be, and that client or my clients have to feel safe or else we're never going to be able to do the type of work that is going to be helpful for them, where they're going to experience uh, relief from symptoms or feel that they have greater ease in their lives. And finally on this list, another barrier to mental health care is uh, having just access to culturally relevant and inclusive care. Um, as I mentioned before, therapy can feel um, there has to be trust, there has to be safety. And when that is in place, a client can be vulnerable, a client can share. But when a client does not feel that they're not going to share, or if they feel that when they are present with their therapist, do they feel that their therapist understands them? Do they feel their therapist um, um, kind of gets them? Do they feel that they're kind of on the same, on the same wavelength? And um, it's important for clients to feel as well that they have the option and the choice to um, meet with and engage with uh, uh, therapists who, with whom they share the same culture, or they perhaps share, have similar um, uh, values or histories. That can also help build the relationship and build, and build trust as well. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention language. Language is also an important way for um, clients to just be able to come to therapy and to be able to share in the language that's most comfortable for them because it allows just freedom of expression. And they don't also have to kind of explain things because that's additional emotional labor. And we don't want our clients to have to to have to do that in session because a session is really less about uh, catering to, right? It's not about catering to the therapist. It's about focusing on what the client's needs are. So I'm a proponent in um, to use, I'm a proponent of using cultural, um, um, using culture and traditions in therapy and bringing in um, different experiences and making it culturally relevant. 
I use all sorts of um, um, interventions from, um, from art, from popular culture. Um, I use memes sometimes in therapy, um, different things that will resonate with my clients, but I am all about um, cultural expression and utilizing that in a way that resonates with clients as a tool for engagement. Because if, if folks aren't engaged, um, they may attend a session once, but they won't come back. They have to feel like they have an investment and that there's something in it for them. Um, again here, um, family and cultural traditions um, for individuals in terms of um, healing practices, food, stories, what are the things that um, help with calming, with grounding, and sharing and exchanging those within uh, communities or even within families. Um, I want to share with you briefly, um, and I'll kind of, I'll probably, uh, for, the, for the sake of time, kind of scroll through it briefly, um, this uh, comic, I don't know if it'll come up here, um, this one right here. So this is a comic uh, that um, was done a little earlier in the pandemic uh, in 2020, where this comic shared her experience of what the pandemic was like and the challenge of being um, part of kind of a closely knit um, um, family. So I'll just kind of go through this. And this will also be, I'll list this link in the, um, in the uh, resources page. But she just kind of goes through here and kind of shares what's happening and what happened in her family and, um, and so forth. So, all right, um, looking at our time. Um, so these will all be um, slides that you'll be able to, to see um, afterward. And so we have creating a routine in terms of how to um, navigate some of the emotional challenges. Creating a routine. So you may have to update your routine, but having a routine to start your day will help kind of position you to have a, um, um, to kind of, to kind of, um, in, to kind of in, engage with your day in a different way. If you're able to notice your feelings and thoughts and recognize that in terms of a pandemic, what feelings are okay, they're all okay. Any feelings that you are experiencing are valid. And if you're able to be present with them, try to, try to just notice what you're feeling. Also don't do too much. If you note your speed in terms of how you're doing things and pump your brakes as well. Um, I mentioned state changes. So not just being in one place, um, going from place to place, whether it's in your home, going outside, inside, um, making a point to interact with at least one person every day and utilizing technology to do that, perhaps going for walks. Um, take moments to reflect on the joyful gifts of your family of origin that your family of origin, your loved ones have given you, whether they're songs, recipes, jokes, or experiences and try to engage in at least one element of the physical or emotional uh, psychic care every day for yourself, because that's that whole, that kind of whole body, whole body health care uh, that, and when you are well, then that supports the community in being well. And these are my resources and um, that's it. That's what I have to share and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Wonderful. You're, you're, thank you so much for being here. Your tone is very relaxing. Like I would, um, <laughs> it would be great therapy to just come and listen to you talk. <laughs> um, I, I just, I want to thank you for providing the tips at the end. I don't know if that was on a slide or not. I couldn't see the slide, but just oh, to okay. remind, remind folks, pump your brakes. I really like that. Um, part of what COVID is asking us to do is slow down and to, to kind of uh, be less kind of moving around. So I think give our, we need to give ourselves a break. So I like to pump your brakes, interact with one person per day, change your state, get outside, go for a walk. Um, and also importantly, I thought reach back to your, um, to uh, 
to experiences from your family life and, and uh, culture and upbringing to like really root yourself um, in some cultural tra traditions. I really appreciate those uh, pointers for what we can do. I'm gonna ask people to go ahead and put questions in the chat um, and we may be able to, to call on you to unmute. Um, but I, I do know that there, were, there was at least one question while you were talking uh, I think you spoke to the first part, uh, and this is um, Sarah Yoon was asking you to speak to how to provide cultural, culturally competent care, which I think I heard you do, but if you want to add anything, you can. And then the second question is, how can we make our workplaces feel safe and acknowledge microaggressions and racism, especially in light of the politicization of COVID, especially as regards uh, Asian Pacific Islander uh, healthcare workers and other types of staff? All right, so um, I would say I'll start with the, 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 the last one first. I think the thing that um, really hampers us is when we don't talk about things. I think when we act like things aren't happening and we don't highlight what's going on. I think that when we um, try to kind of sweep things under the rug, try to minimize, that does a disservice to everyone involved because that's 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 kind of what folks who don't want just keeping it real folks who don't want folks of color to thrive they want you to sweep it under the rug they don't want you to talk about it they want you to remain um silent and they they have no issue with folks suffering in silence and that is why in terms of um folks in, in workplaces talking about what's going on and, and talking about the reality of that and leaving space for people to, to kind of be able to exhale. And also in workplaces, pre-pandemic, we maybe didn't need to take as many breaks. Now we need to take breaks. Now we need to be able to engage in more um, self-regulation, um, self-regulation in terms of calming our bodies self-regulation in terms of being with our spirits. And so that's one piece, but also taking what people have to share as, um, as that is their experience and that is their truth. And I, I think what happens sometimes in workplaces, um, things can be minimized. And do you have any recommendations for, I guess what I would call allies? Um, Cause I, what I feel like I hear you saying is that that validation of these experiences is particularly important versus minimization of them. And so I'm just wondering if you have any tips for what, what allies can do, however you consider yourself an ally, not just the people of color, but also sure. you know, um, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity communities and, and uh, you know, communities of ability. So how, what are some, some tips for allies to, to um, open that space? I think one of the key things is to step in and interrupt when you can. I mean, it's also kind of, kind of looking at issues around safety, but stepping in where you can. If you notice that something is happening, it's interrupting the flow of something that is damaging. It is, it's that idea of saying something. And sometimes it's not even knowing what to say after you interrupt, but just getting in there and pausing what's going on and interrupting the momentum of something that is harmful, something that is, that is hurtful or damaging, that is enough um, to get the attention and to just stop, um, to, yeah, just to kind of um, shift the, the momentum of where things are going. Um, I like to ask the question. Um, many times there are cues that you can use to, you know, to stop or interrupt, as you said. Could you, you know, enumerate some of those cues? Sure. Um, there are a couple that you can use. Um, one, sometimes that people use, they say "ouch," or even just saying something simply to say "whoa." <laughs> or to even or even to interrupt and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Could you say that again? <laughs> right. So so and it, and it doesn't even have to be you don't have to have uh, the antidote. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have all the solutions, <laughs> but merely um, just pausing someone and interrupting mm -hmm. um, them 
because sometimes also those people don't necessarily know that, but sometimes people do know that something that they said has caused harm, but sometimes people just say things and to address microaggressions, just asking someone to repeat what they have said. Thank you. So I had a couple questions about just in the context of COVID, are, have, what are the sort of transformational ways to, um, that you have employed now? Because a lot of your interactions are probably not in person. So how are you, right. how are you doing therapy? How are you able to engage? And do you have any um, you know, new innovative ways? Because I mean, we have Zoom and that yes. might be the responses, but yeah. Well, um, so I have clients that I work with pre-pandemic and then I'm working with them now um, um, in the pandemic. And I have other clients where I've never met them face-to-face. -face. I've never met them in person. Uh, I find that um, I use um, videos as tools. I also, um, you know, in terms of in session, so we'll watch something together and process it and talk about it. Um, I'll have them, um, I, I give them, um, activities and things to engage in in their world, right? Things that, that help them engage with the world around them. Um, I'm also pretty, even in my little rectangle, I'm, I tend to be in session, I tend to be pretty expressive. So I try to use, I, I actually use the whole space. I will find, you know, I'll, I'll kind of either stand up or I'll turn. Um, so I use, use kind of the visual space as a way to um, to engage, uh, to engage clients. Um, but yeah, I do use, I do use, um, a video, uh, a telehealth platform to be able to work with clients and, um, yeah. And it's been, it's been pretty, it's been pretty effective because I've, it, for the most part, for most of my career, I've been doing things in person. So it's definitely been an adjustment, but, um, but I think it's, um, allowed people to have more access and different type of access to care. Um, I don't know, is any hands up or any other questions? Because I have more questions. I'm going to go to my next question, which is, can you comment on, um, do you, have you noted in diverse communities, are you aware of um, differential rates of, of suicide and suicide attempts um, in diverse communities during this pandemic? Because I know that suicide in general has gone up. Have we seen friends? in the different communities? There, what I'm, what I'm seeing, it has gone up, but what I'm seeing um, more so reliance on substances. So people uh, maybe who just had maybe a glass of wine or two a week are doing like a bottle every day or every other day, right? So it's relying on substances to, um, to kind of ease the pain of, of whether it's isolation the anxiety when they're feeling sad. So yeah, so it's relying on substances. That's what I'm seeing more of. Um, and, um, and I do think that people are, are expressing more distress. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, with uh, clients, we talk through things like care plans, safety planning, doing a lot of that to make sure that those things are in place um, and folks have resources. So really talking about not just, um, so safety care planning, but not just kind of creating it and, and kind of tossing it at the client, but actually going through and mapping out, okay, this is something that sometimes folks access. Is this something that you think you would utilize? And if they say no, we keep it moving. So we really try to create something that is specific for that individual that when they are in a state of crisis that they will be able to access. Mm -hmm. Great, I see a question in the chat from uh, Shalini Chatterjee. Um, and I'll read it. And, and Shalini, if you want to unmute and speak up, feel free to do so. Um, it sounds like what she's experiencing is that in some situations, clients say things that are harmful to her as the practitioner um, or about communities around her. Mm -hmm. And do you have any suggestions for strategies to call clients um, in, to call them out, mm -hmm. to recognize the harm while maintaining your relationship? Right. So yeah, this is, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, 
so one of the things that I, I mean, I've worked with a variety of people from um, different ethnic backgrounds, ability levels, sexual orientations, genders. And I found that if I'm able to um, talk about who I am, because if someone says something, let's say that is um, questionable about a black person and I am in front of them, well, that's, that's, that's part of the work. That's part of the therapeutic work. So really for, for me and working with clients, um, there are a few things that are off limits. So that's where I would say, you know, if they share something, I might, that is kind of, um, that is a more challenging uh, to my spirit. I might say, you know, as a person of, you know, as, as a black person, as you shared that, how is it for you to share that with me? What's it like for you? So it's not about me saying, there's a thing that you it's, it's really about how is it for you to share that with me and to be able to, to be uh, more in conversation so there isn't um, shaming that's happening. Because then sh when, shame, when shame comes into the picture, folks shut down and that's not what we want. And that seems like that might be useful just for your, your typical work-related uh, colleague microaggressions or whatever space that you're in. So like, what's that like to kind of say that to me right now? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good, a, a good call out. Um, and uh, so we have another question about, could you speak to the challenges and difficulties of patients with chronic health conditions that um, also are impacting their mental health during this time with increased uh, isolation, social isolation due to COVID? Well, there is the, um, just the multiple levels of worry, because especially for clients, um, clients who have had who um, even are in the younger side who have cancer and are in treatment, they're having, they're, they're, they're kind of having to play with a whole other card deck, right? They're having to consider things um, around, um, uh, just things that their peers aren't having to think about. It's not for them. It's not just about, um, you know, um, baby pandas and exchanging that to pass the time. It's about really thinking about health and having to make serious decisions. And what, um, what I'm finding is, is in terms of the isolation, folks um, um, feeling pulled to withdraw, kind of just kind of wanting to stay at home. And even as they're at home, not engaging with folks kind of finding a place, feeling that like, you know, even though they could perhaps, you know, I mean, be out, you know, maybe on their patio, masked, or even, you know, engage in the world in other ways, they, um, they want to stay in bed, they want to stay in their rooms, they don't want to talk to folks. And, um, and so there is the isolation that's being kind of asked of us, but there's also kind of this, the isolation that's happening related to um, their emotional state and depression. So with, with those clients, we really try to really try to talk about, um, I kind of try to, to lead with values based um, um, to kind of get people sometimes out of the, the, if the emotional thing is really kind of weighing them down um, to kind of route it through, well, what do you value? What are the things that you value? How, um, you know, what are the things in terms of, of the way that you engage with the world? How, you know, what are the things that you um, want to see? How are the things that you value? How do you, how do you kind of, how have you been living those? So we talk in that way. And then we, you know, then we do bring in the emotional piece as well. Sarah, I don't know if that answers your, um, your question. Yes, thank you so much. So um, you'll, you might notice that there is a link in the chat. So please go ahead and click that link. If you'd like to fill out the evaluation, we would love to get your feedback um, on this talk, your interest in um, uh, other topics for CAB2, your interest in, in continuing to be on our CAB2 list, remind you also to um, invite uh, two folks to the next CAP2 so we can continue to grow. Cassandra, we invite you to invite two folks and to continue to join us if you have time. Um, so uh, we're gonna let you have this five minutes to fill out the evaluation, um, but I also welcome any additional um, questions that anyone might have. You can either raise a hand, throw it in the chat, unmute yourself. Um, 
Cassandra, because we couldn't see that lab, I couldn't see it, maybe others could see it, but the resource slide, I'd really like to get your list of resources if possible. Sure. Uh, and share that out with everybody. Sure, I certainly can. And um, I saw that the um, the comic, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a comic sci-fi nerd. So um, I use that also in session um, with clients. And there's some comics that, there's one comic, um, and this will be in the resource um, list, that's called the COVID Chronicles. And there's one comic that talks about um, um, that were different folks of color. It's a variety of folks of all ethnicities globally, but there are some works in there by folks of color talking about how the pandemic has impacted them and their communities. Um, and, um, and, I'll, and on the resources list, there's a link to the one that I was going to show you about um, intergenerational support within um, this particular uh, Latinx um, artist's uh, family. Excellent. And do you mind if, you know, there are, are a number of different agencies and uh, as well as individuals represented here on this meeting, some of those agencies are going to want to share out that resource list um, with their networks as well. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Everybody gets on board. Everybody gets a, everybody gets a turn. You got to do it. Excellent. Um, I think you're getting a lot of, uh, getting some thanks in the chat. Uh, we will be asking people in the evaluation if they want to have more contact with you. So um, would you mind if we're connecting you through, um, once we figure out who those folks are and have their email address. If you say you want to be in touch with Cassandra, please give us your contact information. We won't be sharing it publicly, but we will share it with Cassandra and try to um, help make those connections. So um, please fill out the, the survey link. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Um, any closing words for us, Cassandra? Um, the, only, the only thing I just want to, to just highlight is any of the emotions that we're experiencing are all valid. It's like a smorgasbord where it's all on the table. So nothing is abnormal. Thank you. Thank you for the validation because I know there's a lot of emotions um, that I think people aren't expecting. And as we enter into the third year of this pandemic with promises made, promises not delivered on, um, I think we're gonna have to find our way out of kind of the stigma of, of this idea that we have control over COVID and if you got COVID that somehow you failed. Um, and I think that that's, that's probably going to be a big hurdle um, as we start to emerge into a new way of being for people to get over. So thank you so much for, again, I think the, the underpinning of all of this is, is about validation of the human experience. So really want to thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs>